Hey guys, welcome back to Finn Scales and Fluffy Tales. My name is Bryn, and today I'm going to be trying a different type of video. I decided to try my hand at a voiceover video, so you won't be seeing me this time. I'm redoing my how to get a dog videos because honestly, I really can't stand to watch them. The night I recorded them, it was super late and I didn't feel tired, but you can definitely tell that I was tired. Plus, there's so much to say about this topic that I thought it would sound better and be better if I read directly from a script, which keeps me from rambling and getting off topic. So without further ado, let's get into it. Like I said in the original video, this is a huge debate among the pet community. Other pet YouTubers that I follow mostly talk about other animals and hardly ever talk about dogs. Most of them also got their dogs from a shelter and are all in support of the hashtag adopt don't shop movement. Rarely do any of them speak of reputable breeders as an option to obtain a dog. However, I really do think that it is unfair to just expect everyone to be able to get a dog from the shelter. Adopting is great, but it's not for everyone. So in this video, I'm going to be going over what to look for in a good breeder, red flags for bad breeders, and some of the cons of trying to get a dog from the shelter. So what makes a good breeder? There are a few things that I looked for when picking the breeders of the dogs that Alex and I wanted to get. They are as follows. American Kennel Club confirmation titles, an up-to-date website, a spay-neuter contract, a waiting list, health guarantee, and health testing. As I said in a previous video, the Shih Tzu Club of America does not have any health tests that they require, but the Poodle Club of America covers all sizes of poodles, and many AKC toy poodle breeders do health testing on their breeding dogs. The reason why I wanted a breeder who shows their dogs in AKC confirmation events like dog shows is because the dogs that compete in these shows have to have pedigrees. A dog who is not registered with the AKC cannot compete. To be registered with the AKC, the dog's parents must also be registered and so on. The breeder is usually the one who does this. No dog can be registered with the AKC by just a DNA test alone. Everything is linked to lineage with the AKC. In our specific case, as you guys know, we need a purebred dog because of the allergies in Alex's family. He and his family are all allergic to dog dander and some members are also allergic to the proteins in saliva. Because of this, we need to be absolutely sure that our dog is not mixed with another breed that sheds too much or has a poor coat quality. Some Shih Tzus have better coats than others and dogs that were poorly bred can have a higher shedding coat. I have also found in my experiences that the dog buyer is much less likely to be scammed by a show breeder. Show breeders care very deeply about the puppies they produce and want to make sure they go to loving homes that will not use them to produce more puppies. Show breeders do their very best to protect the breed and preserve it, which means they don't want unscrupulous breeding happening in their stock. Showing proves that they are putting energy, money, and effort into bettering the breed. This brings me to my next point, which is a spay neuter contract. Responsible breeders sell puppies to pet homes on a spay neuter contract only. A spay neuter contract is a document that you as the puppy buyer sign, promising to have the dog altered by a certain time that is agreed upon by breeder and owner, and at which time the breeder agrees to send the owner the AKC limited registration papers. This document also gives the breeder the first right of recovery, meaning that if you as the owner cannot care for the puppy at any point during its lifetime, you are to return the puppy to the breeder instead of selling it, giving it away, and most importantly, dropping it off at a shelter. This also debunks the huge misconception that all breeders are contributing to the number of dogs in shelters. This could not be further from the truth. By signing this document, you are promising not to breed the puppy, to get them spayed or neutered, and that you will not abandon the puppy in a shelter and return it to the breeder if the situation arises. This proves that these breeders care about the breed and all the puppies they produce, unlike backyard breeders and puppy mills. Something else that good breeders put in their spay neuter contract is a health guarantee. This means that the breeder guarantees that the puppy will be free from genetic defects for an allotted amount of time, usually one or two years. If the puppy dies of a genetic defect or gets sick with something within so long of you picking them up and this is verified by a third party vet, your puppy will either be replaced, meaning you will get a puppy from the next litter for no additional charge, or they will refund you the money you paid for the puppy. 
This is important because it protects you as the buyer and the breeder. This shows that the breeder is going to do their best to be honest, upfront, and give you a healthy puppy. An up-to-date website is something I personally look for because I like to keep track of the breeders I'm researching. I like to see new wins and updates on litters as I'm waiting. Some breeders have a Facebook page in lieu of a website, which again is fine with me. Facebook can be easier to update than a website. However, Facebook is free and it doesn't take much to make it look nice and professional. Just because they have a Facebook page, that does not necessarily mean they're a good breeder. You should be looking for pictures of show dogs and wins on their page. The dogs should be in show cuts if you're getting that type of breed, and you should see some pictures of the handler posing with the dog and the judge of the competition. If you cannot find proof of showing titles or show dogs, or if all their dogs are only in puppy cuts or pet clips, this may be a backyard breeder. If you really like them and want to be sure, send them a message or call and ask questions. Breeders can be very busy people, but they will most likely get back to you within a week. Be sure to investigate fully before committing to anything. Another sign of a responsible breeder is a waiting list. I know, I know, many people want their puppy right now. However, the saying, good things come to those who wait, can also be applied here. Just because you can go to the pet store and purchase a puppy today doesn't mean that it's a good idea. Remember that you are investing in your dog's future and health when buying from a good breeder. Many show breeders only have one to three litters per year, depending on the breed and how many dogs they keep. When breeders keep a waiting list, this means that they care very much about who gets one of their puppies, and they aren't just selling them first come first serve when the puppies are on the ground, meaning they're already born. Many backyard breeders will not advertise puppies until they are already born or close to being ready to go home. Backyard breeders will try to take advantage of impulsive people to get their money, whereas a responsible breeder will make sure that the people who want their puppies have done their research on the breed and have chosen wisely. A good breeder will never place a puppy in a home just to get the money. They want to make sure that your home is a good fit for the breed that you picked. Last, but certainly not least, is that good breeders do health testing on their breeding stock. This, of course, depends on the breed as well. As I've mentioned previously, the Shih Tzu Club of America does not require health testing. However, many other breed clubs do require testing. All AKC breeders of large dog breeds will be required to produce OFA testing of eyes and hips at the minimum. Most breed clubs require more tests of diseases specifically for that breed. As many of you know, large breed dogs are very prone to hip dysplasia, which is a condition where the hip bone does not stay in the socket and pops out frequently, causing pain and immobility. This is a similar condition to luxating patella in small dogs where the kneecap moves in and out of the joint, again causing pain and possibly immobility of the knee. Both of these conditions can require surgery to correct if it is very bad. There are also genetic blood tests that some breeds need to prove that they are not carriers of certain ailments. All these tests are important because if a breeder is testing for hereditary diseases, they will not breed dogs who can pass down these ailments to their puppies, meaning you'll be getting a healthier dog because of it. Even breeders of small breeds who are not required to do testing are, in my opinion, still better breeders than backyard breeders. All show breeders have a knowledge of dog genetics that greatly surpasses that of the average person, and even some vets. Individual veterinarians unfortunately cannot be familiar with every breed of dog. There are 197 dog breeds registered with the AKC alone, and that does not count the ones that are still in the waiting period. New breeds are being recognized every single year. The breeders who have been working with a specific breed for many years will have a much better understanding of that breed than the neighbor next door who just wants to have a litter. Show breeders also keep records of every dog they've ever produced and shown. They also take their dogs to the vet for regular checkups. After years of keeping records, they will notice if a breeding produced a health problem and retire those dogs from breeding. A breeder's aim should be to better and preserve the breed, not just to make money selling puppies. The things you should be looking for in a responsible breeder are American Kennel Club confirmation titles, an up-to-date website, a spay-neuter contract, a waiting list, health guarantee, and health testing depending on breed. However, some of these things are more important than others. In my opinion, AKC confirmation titles, spay-neuter contract, and health testing are much more important than a website or waiting list. 
use your discretion. One of the Shih Tzu breeders I found does not have a waiting list or a website, but she has proof of showing on her Facebook page. When I messaged her, she also wanted me to tell her about where I live and what kind of family I have, which let me know that she does care about where her puppies go. In contrast, a toy poodle breeder I was looking at did not have a website or a waiting list, just a Facebook page where I could not find proof of showing. I decided not to consider that breeder. Again, do your research, ask questions, and do not commit to a puppy without proof. I am now going to briefly explain the differences between show dog lines and working dog lines. There is a difference, and in some breeds, the difference is more noticeable than in others. Many show breeders who breed dogs in the hound group, working group, herding group, sporting group, and terrier group also work their dogs in field trials and other events. Since these dogs were originally meant for work, many breeders see the importance of using the dogs for their original purposes. However, sometimes the dogs in show lines just cannot compete with a dog who has been bred specifically for work. In my opinion, if you are getting a dog to go hunting with you, work on your farm, herd your animals, or guard your home or family, you should be going to a breeder who does those things. Show breeders do a great job preserving the breeds they work with, but sometimes a working dog is just better suited to do the job. Linked in the description below is a video from the channel Dogumentary TV, where he interviews a woman who breeds and trains working border collies and how her dogs differ from the show lines. This will give you a better explanation of what I'm talking about. In the video, the woman being interviewed believes that the show lines of Border Collies have temperament problems and claims that they are much more unhealthy than working lines. I do not agree with that statement, but she does a great job of explaining the differences between working and show lines. That being said, still be sure to investigate thoroughly. Ask for proof of working competition titles or videos of the dog doing its job. I would hope that breeders of working lines would also do health testing to make sure nothing is getting passed down. The main difference between working and show lines is that breeders of working lines care less about looks and more about working ability. The dog may not have a perfect coat or confirmation, but can herd, guard, or retrieve waterfowl with the best of them. Now that you know what to look out for in a good breeder, I will continue the discussion with red flags to look out for. These may be signs that you're dealing with a bad breeder. There are two main types of bad breeders, which are puppy mills and backyard breeders. The definition of a puppy mill is a facility that produces and offers more than two breeds of dogs. This operation is usually on a large scale. Pet stores get their puppies from puppy mills, but you can find puppy mills online as well. They will have multiple litters on the ground ready to go home and many different breeds, possibly mixes, and sometimes exotic colors. They will also use words like teacup, mini, imperial, and royal. These words mean that they are not breeding to the AKC standard of purebred dogs and are just trying to draw people in to buy puppies. Dogs that are bred smaller than they're supposed to be can have many health problems later in life. Backyard breeders operate on a much smaller scale. They also sometimes use words like teacup, mini, imperial, and royal. Backyard breeders breed for different reasons. Some are running a smaller scale breeding business. They may have a few dogs that they breed occasionally, but they do not show their dogs. Sometimes their dogs are AKC registered and sometimes they're not. A backyard breeder is also someone who just wanted to have a litter of puppies. They have a pet and they're looking to breed that pet before they get them fixed because they believe she'll be a better dog if she has a litter or they just want to keep one of the puppies. Again, this person does not have show dogs. Usually their dog or dogs are not registered with the AKC. Most of the time, backyard breeders will put ads to sell their puppies in the newspaper, on Facebook, or Craigslist. In small towns, you will also hear about litters by word of mouth. Sometimes the dogs are purebred, but most of the time they are not. Puppy mills are tricky because they make their websites look so professional and legitimate. It can be hard to pick one out online. Most backyard breeders do not have a website, but sometimes they do, especially if they are trying to seem like a legitimate breeder or business. Facebook pages for backyard breeders are very common. Some backyard breeders care about their dogs because they're breeding their pets, but this depends on the person. People who have accidental litters can also be considered backyard breeders. The biggest red flag for bad breeders is pet stores. Any puppy that is sold in a pet store comes from a puppy mill. 
As I mentioned previously, a puppy mill is defined as any facility that breeds and produces more than two breeds of dogs. No good breeder sells puppies through pet stores because they want to know who their puppies go to. Show breeders will never offer more than two breeds. Usually show breeders who have two breeds of dogs are a husband and wife team where one shows and breeds one breed and the other shows and breeds a different breed. Pet stores like Petland and the Family Puppy have their own puppy mills that they source their dogs from. They make it look so professional when they show you the videos of where the puppies come from, but don't be fooled. They won't call it a puppy mill because most people think of terrible conditions and matted, dirty dogs. Just because they keep the dogs a little cleaner does not mean you are getting a puppy that was bred with care. Most of the puppies they have in these facilities are not even close to meeting the breed standards for their breed, which could mean worse health problems down the line. These facilities also offer dogs in colors that the AKC does not accept, such as white or liver miniature schnauzers as an example. The only colors for miniature schnauzers that are accepted by the AKC is salt and pepper, solid black, and black and silver. I have also seen Merle French Bulldogs. The Merle gene introduces many health problems to the Frenchie breed and is hard to work with. The Merle gene can cause blindness and deafness if two dogs with Merle coats are bred together. Sometimes the Merle gene can be hidden, so it can be very hard to keep track of if the lineage is not documented. So, for example, one dog could have the hidden Merle gene and another one could have a visible Merle gene. The two dogs are bred together because the breeder didn't know the lineage of one of the dogs and then half the puppies are born blind and deaf. Merle is not a naturally occurring color in French Bulldogs or Poodles, which I have also seen. For many breeds, Merle is not a naturally occurring color, so somewhere in the dog's lineage it was mixed with a breed that carries Merle. The problem with this type of breeding is it is only done to make more money, no other reason. People will pay huge amounts of money for a unique dog when in reality unscrupulous breeding like this can really hurt the breed and cause health problems later in life. Backyard breeders will also do this to try to make more money as well. Backyard breeders and puppy mills will also produce designer dogs to make more money. I am against the purposeful breeding of designer dogs and other mutts. There are so many mixed breeds in shelters that people should not be purposefully breeding doodles, pomskis, cavapoos, shichons, or any other type of mix. In my personal opinion, if you want a dog like this, you should be going to the shelter where there are plenty of mixed breeds. The worst part about these mixes is that many breeders will lie to tell the buyer what they want to hear. Doodles are not always hypoallergenic, and the ones that are, are 75% poodle anyway. That is how much poodle needs to be introduced into the bloodline before it starts producing the correct coat texture. At that point, there is no reason to get a doodle because almost all the other traits of the other breed have been bred out. If you need a hypoallergenic dog, get a poodle or other breed with a drop coat or wire coat. It is also a misconception that adding lab or golden retriever to poodle genes helps them settle down sooner in life. As someone who works with many doodles daily, I can say that they are excessive barkers and pretty hyper on the whole. I would not describe them as calm or laid back. Many breeders of designer dogs, including doodles, do not do health testing on their stock. This has been my experience. They are just producing these dogs for the money. Doodles and other designer dogs often cost more to obtain from a breeder than a purebred dog. Paying more does not always mean better quality. In my opinion, any breeder who produces designer dogs is a backyard breeder or puppy mill. Dogs should be bred to preserve breeds, not just to make a quick buck. There are so many mixed breed dogs in shelters already, we do not need more being produced by uncaring breeders. Another thing I want you to be aware of is that not all AKC breeders are created equal. What I mean by that is, even in the American Kennel Club, the quality of breeders varies widely. The reason I look for breeders who show is because many times I have come across breeders online who have, quote, AKC registered dogs, but they do not participate in events. A few years back, I came across a Shih Tzu breeder located in Michigan online. She had one of the best websites I had found and it was always updated. She produced five or more litters every year and I loved going to the nursery portion of her website and looking at all the adorable puppies, which had prices listed right under their pictures. 
Every week, she had updated pictures posted of each puppy. As the months went on and I kept returning to her website to daydream about my future dog, I realized I did not like the look of any of her adult dogs. That seems kind of shallow, I know, but I knew that I wanted a puppy with a good coat texture because of Alex's allergies and because I wanted to keep her hair long. Puppies grow into their parents and I did not want a dog that looked like any of hers. This breeder shaved all her dogs down to the skin. There were never any pictures of them with long hair. I began to get worried because I couldn't see the coat quality or texture with them shaved like that. I also noticed that she didn't show her dogs in AKC confirmation events and her puppies were almost twice the price of puppies from a show breeder where both parents would be champions. I realized then that this person was just taking advantage of her AKC registered dogs to charge people an astronomical price for a fairly common breed. I contacted her before asking why she always shaved her dogs and what the coat texture was like. I also told her about me and that I would be interested in a puppy in the future. I never heard from her at all. She is still in operation today. In my opinion, she is a crook for charging more money for a puppy than show breeders when she does not spend the time, effort, or money on bettering the breed. This is the kind of thing you need to look out for. Do not be scammed into spending more money for a lower quality puppy. Shih Tzu puppies from show breeders should be between $1,200 and $2,000 depending on where you live. If a breeder who does not show their dogs charges more than that, run. On the opposite end of the spectrum, a cheap puppy does not mean you are getting a bargain. With purebred dogs, you get what you pay for. A puppy for $500 or less sounds great. It's easy on the wallet. However, remember that by buying from a good breeder, you are investing in your dog's health and future. Most of us would do anything for our dogs. If they got sick or hurt later in life, we would pay whatever the vet needed to save their lives. Why then do owners not invest this money in their puppy's health right from the beginning? Is it not worth investing $1,200 in your puppy's health to give them a better chance at a healthy life? Do you really need that puppy right now? Most of the time, if you are willing to wait a little longer and save a little more money for a puppy from a responsible breeder, you won't have to go through the heartbreak of having to put your dog down due to a genetic condition that is easily tested for. This is the kind of situation I want people to avoid. You will have a much lower chance of the dog developing a health problem if you go to a show breeder rather than a breeder who does not health test their stock. Be very wary of someone charging $500 or less for a puppy. If a breeder is charging cheap prices, you can bet they're not spending the money to health test their adults. Another sign of a bad breeder is how they treat their dogs. Puppies should never leave their mother and litter mates before eight weeks old. It is also illegal in many states to sell a puppy before eight weeks. If a breeder tells you that they let their puppies go before eight weeks old, you are dealing with a backyard breeder. If the breeder does not let you meet the puppy's parents, or see where the puppies are raised, this is another red flag. Good breeders will be honest and open with you and encourage you to come into their home and meet the dogs, except during COVID. Many breeders have different rules right now. Be very wary if they won't send you any pictures of their house or facility and insist on meeting you at a halfway point with the puppy. This could be a sign that they're keeping their dogs in poor conditions that they don't want you to see. There are many reasons why people decide to look for a puppy from a breeder, some of which are allergies, other pets, children, and wanting a dog for a specific job. Not all dogs, even of the same litter or breed, are equipped to do certain tasks. Service dogs, for example, have to be specifically bred for that purpose most of the time. They have to have the correct temperament for the job. Most people with children want a tolerant dog who grows up knowing their family and may not have the time or the know-how to deal with past emotional or behavioral issues of a shelter dog. Others have an allergy in the family, so they need to be sure that the dog they are getting is low shedding so as not to offset that family member's allergies. And yet others have other pets that may not get along so well with certain dogs. All these reasons are good reasons to get a dog from a responsible breeder. However, I don't think it's necessary for people to have to explain themselves. As long as you get a dog from a responsible breeder, the simple answer of, I wanted a well-bred dog and I love this breed is good enough. 
Rescues are also great places to get a dog. It is true that there are many types of dogs in shelters and potentially one for everyone. One of the best perks of adopting from a shelter is the lower initial cost of the animal. Even puppies at shelters will be $600 or a little less depending on breed. I have never come across a dog in a shelter whose adoption fee was $1,000 or more. So at least initially, it is more cost effective to adopt a dog from a shelter or rescue. The obvious downside to a shelter dog is that you don't know that dog's past. You probably don't know if it was abused or neglected, and unless it was an owner surrender who told the shelter staff everything about the dog, you just won't know what they're like. What I mean by that is there may be some unexpected trauma that the dog went through that needs extra training to be corrected, such as being afraid of everyday sounds in a home if they were kept outside 24 seven. Some dogs may not have been socialized enough as a puppy and might be fearful of strangers and people coming into the house. The dog may have severe separation anxiety from being abandoned by its previous owner and may destroy things in the house or frantically try to escape a crate when you leave. Sometimes it is so bad that the dog self harms out of stress. These are serious issues that the shelter staff or rescue will hopefully tell you about before adoption so you can decide if you have the time and possibly money to spend on professional trainers to help this dog. Not knowing its past can also mean you don't know the lineage. Therefore, you could be spending money on some hefty vet bills later in that animal's life. It could get a hereditary disease that costs a lot of money to manage or fix. So though you save money initially, these are potential costs that you must think of and save for when you adopt a dog from a shelter. Pet insurance should always be considered for this reason. Another downside to shelter dogs is that sometimes it seems like the shelters and rescues are very picky. They have to be picky because they want all their dogs to go to good homes. However, I feel like sometimes they exclude young people or young families from adopting dogs. Of course, some dogs are not good with kids or other pets, and that's just a fact. But when I was still in grad school looking to adopt a dog, I was having a difficult time even finding one to apply for. I was looking on Pet Finder and many shelters were requiring potential adopters to be a retired couple or work from home and have a fenced in yard. I was a college student living in a one bedroom apartment, but I felt that I could have given an older Shih Tzu or a Yorkie a loving home, especially since everything I read about those breeds said they were good apartment dogs. I was looking for an older Shih Tzu or Yorkie that would sleep and relax most of the time, but I would have been denied for applying for those dogs. Also, some of the dogs I was looking into came as a bonded pair, but I didn't have time for two dogs. Others were not good with other dogs, and though I didn't have a second dog at the time, I knew that we wanted to get a second dog at some point. My parents have two dogs, and Alex's parents have a dog, so I wanted to make sure my dog would get along with other dogs so we could take it with us when we traveled for holidays. I didn't even want to consider dogs that weren't good with kids because I knew at some point Alex and I would want to start our own family and I would want to bring the dog to family events where kids would probably be present. I couldn't bring a dog that hated kids to a family event, so I knew those dogs wouldn't work for us either. These are just some examples of the troubles I was having with shelters. All in all, if you don't care about having a purebred dog with a pedigree, going to the shelter is the best place to get a dog. There are so many dogs out there that need homes and many will not have the issues that I discussed in this video. I just wanted to make you, as the viewer, aware of the potential issues with shelters to help in your search for your next companion. If you need or want a purebred dog, please do your research and buy a puppy from a responsible breeder. Please do not support puppy mills, pet stores, or backyard breeders. Thanks again for tuning in and watching this video. If you want to see more content, follow us on Instagram at finnscalesfluffytails. Stay tuned because later this year, Alex and I will hopefully be bringing home our first puppy. Thanks again for watching. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and I will catch you on the next one.